Okay, okay. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll, we'll be a little bit adaptive. We'll see. I have a, th a third part in my talk uh, which might be skipped. Uh, but the theme is uh, optimization dynamics, okay, and how they, they can be important in large-scale systems, how they're important when we try to design ad uh, adaptive uh, methods. I won't talk too much about that. And uh, how uh, optimization dynamics can actually, algorithmic dynamics can actually interact with system dynamics. That's an exciting connection we've had a couple of years ago. Uh, but I will spend most of my time on recent work that we just completed about a month ago uh, on how essentially what we sometimes call adversarial optimization, you can imagine of uh, someone training a GAN, a generative adversarial network. Uh, those problems have some very, very special dynamics when we run optimization methods on them, uh, which require very special tuning, okay? So, and we, we'll, get, we'll get to details. Yes, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, and um, let's start with uh, the basics, okay? Uh, because we're talking about optimization, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, a very quick introduction. Uh, we're going to see the momentum algorithm. What I show here is not the momentum algorithm yet. What I show here is a basic gradient descent step. So this is a very basic, this is the, the, the workhorse of machine learning, uh, gradient step. We're going down the hill. We have an obje objective function f that we want to minimize. Uh, w is our decision variable. It's typically the weight, so as we say, of the model. Okay, so we change the weights to minimize some objective function that comes from some loss that we have decided for our learning problem. Okay, and uh, what we do is we take the gradient. We look at the gradient. It tells us which way is uphill. Uh, we take a minus sign of that, so we go downhill, and then we multiply that with a step size alpha. Okay, that's the gradient descent step. It's important, that's the, the basis of what we're looking at now. And um, so we, we're not seeing momentum yet. I'm confusing you with this slide a bit. This is gradient descent. Uh, but one of the things with gradient descent is it can be slow for badly conditioned problems. What does that mean? I have this objective landscape here, for example. There's this minimum somewhere down here, okay? And uh, the idea is that there is a direction, this kind of curve, along which curvature is low. It's uh, almost flat, okay? And there's another direction perpendicular to that at each point, uh, along which curvature of my objective function is high, which means it looks more like this. Like it's steep, right? Um, so what happens, uh, because we have this contradiction, we have some directions that are flat, some directions that are steep, uh, choosing a good step size is, uh, is difficult, okay? So in order to, to make good progress along the, the, the flatter directions, we need a large step size, but in order to control the oscillations along the steepest directions, we need a small step size. So, and that's at the heart of what makes badly conditioned uh, problems uh, kind of slow to optimize with uh, gradient descent methods, okay? So one idea that came from physics and uh, pioneered by the Soviets, essentially in the 60s. Uh, Polyak here uh, added a momentum term. Now you see the momentum method, okay? The only thing that's changed is, the, is this momentum, uh, this last term that we've added. We have the same thing. We, we start from our previous position, we add the gradient step, and then we add one more uh, step that is the momentum term, one correction term that is the momentum term. So this says, that if, if wt minus d, wt minus one was the step that I took in the previous iteration, okay, I will multiply that with a number that is typically between zero and one, scale it down a little bit, and then add it to my gradient step, okay? So you can think of this as inertia a little bit. If I went that way in the previous step, I will still go that way a little bit in the current step. It's like adding mass and uh, momentum to, uh, our, our point, our current model as we optimize it, okay? And the, the basic idea is that, uh, and the, the result that we know is that this kind of uh, extra term can accelerate optimization, okay? It actually makes us go faster along the flattest directions because it accelerates, it speeds up because we add the same directions over and over and over, and it slows us down controlling the oscillations along the steepest directions. So if we oscillate too much, 
these two terms will actually cancel a little bit. There will be cancellation here. Uh, so it allows us to converge much faster. So that's, that's part of the story, and that's part of the reason why momentum methods are so popular in difficult optimization problems like the ones that we see in machine learning. Okay, any questions about the, the, the basis here? This is what we're building upon. Okay, all right, all right. So one way, this is not super important, but one way to think about it is you can think of uh, uh, ac those accelerated methods, or particular momentum methods, uh, you can think of them as if they are improving the condition number, okay? What is the condition number? It's the ratio of the two extreme eigenvalues of the Hessian. Basically, it tells us what is the, the, the highest curvature, okay? That's the second derivative of a function tell us that. What is the lowest curvature? Again, the second derivative along that direction tells us that. So we divide those two, uh, we take the fraction of those two extreme curvatures, and that's the condition number. So a high number is bad. It's a badly conditioned problem, has a large condition number. And uh, the classic results for specific classes for convex optimization, strongly convex optimization, uh, they tell us that a gradient descent uh, has this convergence rate. So essentially, every time I, with every step I take, I take my, my distance from the minimum shrinks by this amount. I multiply my distance with this amount, okay? And for accelerated methods, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but let's say that the convergence rate improves uh, by replacing the condition number kappa that I used to have with a root kappa. And because those condition numbers are between one and up, they go from one, one to infinity, uh, taking the root makes it smaller and makes the whole number here smaller, which means faster convergence to the minimum, okay? That's kind of a summary of, of acceleration. Um, and then we have the, the stochastic version of those, of those problems, okay? This was gradient descent. What happens with stochastic gradient descent? In machine learning, we do stochastic gradient descent because our objectives are of this form, and we have too many terms in, in this summation. So what happens here is I have a little loss function, f, for each data point, z, which is, uh, it could be, uh, uh, let's say, an x comma y input output pair for our machine learning, supervised machine learning problem, right? This is in z. And w is the current model. So we take all of these, this is our whole data set, and we want to minimize all of those little losses at the same time, or their average, at least, okay? Um, so what we do with stochastic gradient descent is we do not consider this whole average for all of the losses of all of the training examples, but we take, as we say, mini batches, or we take a, a one or a few uh, training examples at a time. So the, the result is that we do not get the full gradient, we get a stochastic gradient, okay? A gradient that's, that's noisy. Um, any questions about SGD? All right, all right. And uh, the momentum version of this is as follows. I've changed the, re rearranged the terms a little bit. And what this says is that my next step is going to be a scaled down version of the previous step. I call the momentum parameter here mu L for reasons that will become apparent in a bit. And then I have my gradient step, okay? I added a little uh, t time index to the, to the step size. That's not very important. But it's, it's the same thing as before, only I have stochastic gradients now, okay? But this is a form that will come up in a little bit in a kind of surprising way. That's why I'm emphasizing it. All right. So I have three things to talk about. I think I will be talking about the first two. And uh, so the first one is a work that's two years old at this point, but it's a surprising connection between uh, between algorithmic dynamics and system dynamics. In a when we do optimization in uh, large-scale systems, asynchronous systems in particular, those dynamics find a, a way to bleed into our numerics, to bleed into the dynamics of our optimization methods. And that was kind of unexpected and kind of a nice uh, discovery with some interesting implications. And the second thing here, the second thing I'm going to talk about is essentially something I've already alluded to, um, games or adversarial optimization, as referred to sometimes, uh, have very special dynamics. 
And in particular, we will see how for training certain GANs, you want to use a negative momentum uh, value, okay? Which is, which is a bit unexpected and interesting, right? Actually, we are going to see this in both. In both of these first sections, I will give you reasons why you might want to use uh, a negative value in your momentum parameter, okay? All right, okay, so the first part. Uh, how do we parallelize a big system? So optimization is, uh, is hard, uh, largely in machine learning, because we have to compute all of those uh, gradients, right? We do forward and back propagation, and that's computationally intensive, and it takes a while. Uh, we're always interested in finding ways to make this faster, of course. And one way is to use more computational power by using more machines, okay, in a cluster. What are the ways we can do this? We can split the work in uh, using a synchronous system. That's the simplest and easiest way to, to set up, okay? It has its benefits, its disadvantages, and it looks like this. Uh, we have a parameter servers that holds the latest version uh, of the model, WT, okay? And we have different workers. These are different machines that compute gradients for us, okay? So the way this, this whole thing works is I will take the SGD, uh, equation, the SGD formula that I had before, and let's say I'm using a mini batch size of 128, okay, that's common, 138 uh, 28 images, right, and I have four workers. I will split this 128 into four uh, chunks of 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, okay, and then I will give the first worker 32 images, the second worker 32 images, and so on. So they will do uh, one quarter of the work each, computing all of those little gradients, one for each of the 32 images, and then we will aggregate them, and we will apply them to the model, and we have the new model. And it's a qu equivalent to serial SGD, so that's easy to understand and to analyze, there's nothing more to do, so that's super nice. One issue, there's this synchronization barrier, okay? In order to do this, we have to wait. Like, we have some workers that are done with their with their work earlier, either due to uh, uneven workload or due to um, inhomogeneous architectures, uh, uh, hardware, or due to network uh, delay and lag, there's all sorts of reasons. So we commonly happen to have, especially with a large number of workers, the first ones waiting for the last ones to finish, also called the stragglers, okay? And that's, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum are fully asynchronous systems, okay? Uh, and the way this works is each worker works on their own mini batch of, let's say, 128 images. Like this guy gets 128, 128, 128. And they do not coordinate. They do not um, work on the same step in some sense. They work as if they were independent. Uh, they were running their own uh, let's say, SGD uh, method, only they share the parameter server. And that's, that's what makes them collaborate in some sense. Uh, so the way, the way things work, uh, actually, we're going to see on the, next, on the next slide. So on an asynchronous system, this is one, let's say, iteration in the life of a single worker, okay? So what happens here is at some point, my worker, worker one, is ready to start uh, one iteration. So it will read the current model from the system. So it will issue a request to the parameter server and get WT, the current model. And then it will take a second, 10 milliseconds, whatever, some time to compute a gradient based on this, uh, on this, on this model and on a specific mini batch of let's say 128 images, okay? What happens because this is a, an asynchronous system is that in the meantime, other workers are done with their individual iterations and are sending back their gradients to the parameter server. So worker two sends their gradient they've been computing to the parameter server, so the model changes to WT plus one. Uh, the worker three does the same and the model changes while we're computing our gradient, right? So there's this, this whole thing. And then at some point, presumably, after how intermediate rights by other workers, our worker is ready to send back the, their gradient and update the model one last time, okay? So while we have been computing our gradient based on model WT, 
the model has changed tau times. The model has been uh, updated tau times, okay? And now we have this discrepancy. We are uh, taking a gradient that has been computed based on an old version of the model, okay? That's what we call stale version of the model, and adding it back on top of a newer version of the model. And that's the challenge with asynchronous systems, uh, that they, they are not equivalent to serial stochastic gradient descent, okay? Which makes them very hard to understand and uh, makes them hard to deploy and tune. And that's, that's one of the big challenges, even though in terms of their hardware efficiency, they're much faster because they do not have those synchronization barriers. No synchronization is necessary. So they're appealing, but they're also challenging because of this staleness. So how do we make sense of this staleness, right? We can model it. So we can say that now uh, we, had, we had the gradient descent before, right? Now this is gradient descent with some staleness. Essentially, we're going to use the gradient from tau steps ago, evaluated on the model of tau steps ago. And now this tau is a, a random variable. It's a discrete random variable that has a probability mass function, and now we can do math with it, okay? Any questions about the model? Okay. So the, the, here I'm repeating the model, and we can uh, say that this Q of L is the probability that my staleness is L. I have L writes in between. I read and I'm writing back my gradient, okay? So the intuition here, the very, very rough intuition, is that because this is a PMF, in expectation, the model on which I am evaluating my gradient on is, let's say, is a combination of previous previous models, okay? It's, this is kind of like memory. So we're using, it's, we're using old versions of the model to compute our gradient, and that can be thought of as memory, okay? So the main result that we have here uh, is the following. So the way we formalize this result, we, we do, under some assumptions that I will explain, uh, we do some analysis, and we say that in expectation, when I have m asynchronous workers, okay? In expectation, the step, the next step I will be taking is a scaled down version of the previous step I took plus a gradient term, okay? And this is the, the same formula that I emphasized earlier when I was introducing momentum. So this is actually an implicit momentum term, okay? So just to clarify, the, the assumption here is that I'm not running any momentum, I'm not using a momentum term on my optimization. My algorithm is gradient descent at this point, okay? That's what I run on my system. And, um, but somehow, these dynamics of the system bleed into my numerics and they make an implicit momentum term appear, okay? And the intuition is that momentum is again like memory. So when you explicitly add the momentum term to your system, it kind of resembles memory. I'm taking a, a previous uh, some previous information from the system, that is a step, but it actually encompasses um, other information too. That's one way to think about it. So both uh, momentum and asynchrony bring something from the past. And under these specific assumptions, I will clarify what this means, they're exactly the same, okay? So I'm not running momentum, but asynchrony gives me momentum that I did not ask for, okay? What is exponential work? This is a common assumption in queuing theory, and uh, it, we're assuming here to get this exact result that the time it takes me to compute a gradient or, the, or a mini batch is exponentially distributed, okay? That's not a great assumption, right? So the exponential uh, distributions have the, the memoryless property, for example. If I, if I stop, if, if, I, if after 10 seconds I'm not done, right, then the time to finish is the same as in the beginning, okay? For people who have studied like, a little bit of queuing theory and uh, there are those interesting properties, a an exponential distribution is not a great assumption, okay? But it gives us this clean result and which result will give us some good intuition which we then verify on an uh, actual system, okay? And at the end, I can plot you roughly the two, distribution, uh, two distributions, how an exponential distribution looks like and how the actual distributions look like. 
for, for staleness, actually. So you can see that they're not that different. Importantly, they both have a queue, a, a tail, typically. Sorry, that was French. So um, the interesting thing about this result is that it does not make any uh, you know, strong assumptions about the function. In, in particular, you, you can have this, this equivalence between asynchrony and momentum for any kind of function, including non-convex functions. Okay? So, okay, so we made some strong assumptions about the distribution of work. We came up with this nice and clean result. Does it tell us anything about, uh, you know, big asynchronous systems in practice is the question. And yes, I'm going to quickly go over uh, a thought experiment and then how we replicate it in, in a real system to verify those results. How much time do I have? Okay. And then we're going to move on to the next section. So let's, let's have this following thought experiment, okay? Uh, on the x-axis, I have the number of workers. On the y-axis, it's the optimal value of momentum for each case. So the, the experiment is as follows. I'm an analyst. I have my favorite model and uh, it does NLP, something, right? And uh, I want to tune it so I can, I can uh, train it in the least uh, time possible, okay? So I have one machine, I tune its hyperparameters, step size and momentum, and I find that 0 0.9 momentum is optimal. Okay, then I'm happy. I say, good, but it takes uh, 15 hours. I want, I want it sooner, so I will, um, use an asynchronous system. Let's say I use a fully asynchronous system. So I throw in more machines at the problem. I throw in a, a second machine, okay? And, uh, or a th third or a fourth, eight machines, 16 machines. I start scaling my, my cluster because I want to go faster. Uh, but I use the same, the same hyperparameters because, you know, 0 0.9 seems good. Well, what the theory suggests is that I will get extra implicit momentum on top of what I added algorithmically, right? And, uh, and the fear is that this can be detrimental. And that's actually the spoiler, that's the case. It's quite detrimental. Uh, okay, so how do, we, how do we verify that? That's one way to verify that. So this is now an uh, actual experiment on a, on a prototype. Uh, and those experiments are, were on AWS. Um, and what we are doing here is the same thing, only we are tuning the hyperparameters at each step. So we're saying, I start with one machine for this problem, I tune my hyperparameters, I get that 0 0.7 momentum, it gives me the fastest convergence, okay? And I will go to two machines, I will tune again, I get that 0 0.6 is, is the best now. I go to four machines, I see 0 0.2 is the best. I go to eight, 0 0.9 is the best. So we, what, what's happening here, so what our explanation is, is that there is ghost momentum here that I get from the dynamics of asynchrony as I increase the, the level of asynchrony in my system, okay? That's why the optimal algorithmic momentum value drops because I have two sources of momentum. One is what I put in my algorithm and one is what I get from the system, okay? Any questions about, about the the, the conclusion here, the, 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 the takeaway message. The takeaway message basically is um, asynchronous systems are very difficult to understand. They're very finicky, and that's one of the reasons why they're not adopted so much. And one of the uh, ways we reason about them is that their dynamics are actually so much more complicated, and the way that people have been tuning them, or not tuning them actually, has been detrimental to their performance. So if you if you have an asynchronous system, you have to um, to tune it, and you cannot rely on the hyperparameters that work on one machine or on a synchronous system. So 0 0.9 does not cut it. Okay, and we have some more experiments here, but I won't bore you with all of this because we have uh, other interesting things to to get to. So I will be skipping some stuff. But I promised you negative momentum. Here's one example where negative momentum can be optimal, okay? So I'm doing CIFAR 10 again. I think this was CIFAR 10. I don't uh, explicitly say that. Uh, but what we have here, the resolution is not very good. Okay, fine. So what we're doing is uh, there's, this is a penalty in terms of the number of steps 
okay? Just to explain the y-axis, how many steps do I need to get to some target accuracy, okay? And that's what, it's a normalized number of steps that I'm plotting on the y-axis. So lower is better, okay? So this is what happens as I scale the number of asynchronous workers if I do not tune my hyperparameters as I'm doing that. I keep a momentum value of 0 0.9 and I go from 1 to 2, 4, 8, 16 asynchronous workers. Okay, I see that the, this penalty explodes. So I need an increasingly large number of steps to get to the same accuracy, okay? Now here's what happens when I tune all of my hyperparameters, step size and momentum, um, and I only tune momentum in the non-negatives, between zero and one, okay? Things are improved, things, are, things look much better. Remember, lower is better. They're all normalized jointly. Uh, and the third curve is what happens if I include a negative values, if I include negative values in my tuning grid for momentum, okay? And in particular, what we get is that for the 16 workers here, uh, the optimal value for momentum was actually negative, minus 0.2, if I remember correctly, okay? So this said that when I went from essentially zero momentum here to minus 0.2 momentum here, I had a significant improvement on the number of steps uh, required to reach the same accuracy, okay? So the, the, the conclusion here for us is that it's especially for large scale asynchronous systems, it's important to consider uh, uh, carefully tuning all of your hyperparameters, including the momentum hyperparameter, and in some extreme cases you will even get that negative values are optimal. On to, on to newer things. All right, so uh, what I showed you so far work is work that I did during my postdoc, uh, but I'm still, uh, you know, fascinated by both momentum methods and studying dynamics in weird uh, cases and in weird exotic situations. So what we have just done is we have finished a project that studies the dynamics of games uh, or adversarial optimization as some people call it. And a prime example in machine learning are the GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, okay? Um, all right, so let me, get, let me get to it. So the message is that, again, games are, have very exciting dynamics, very fascinating dynamics, much like asynchronous systems, they change things uh, significantly. And to, to, to get a grasp of the main, uh, the basic tools we need in this discussion, we're going to start with uh, optimization dynamics, okay? Very, for some of you, this might be a bit trivial, the first few slides, but uh, we will blast through them and then get to the good stuff soon. All right, so uh, optimization. So in optimization, we're interested in minimizing typically an objective function, okay? And the notation here is a little bit different. I apologize for that. Now my, my thetas are kind of like the Ws I had before. They're my decision variables, right? And L of theta is the F I had before. It's my objective function that I want to minimize. And uh, I'm just looking for him, the minimum, right? Theta star. And typically, especially in machine learning, we care about smooth differentiable uh, functions L or objective functions L. And we're looking for the stationary or fixed points in particular, we're looking at, about the, we're looking at the minima, and uh, our minima are always fixed points. I will not address the question of are all our fixed points minima, okay? I'll leave that aside uh, because it's been discussed in other pieces of work. Excuse me. Okay, so we use gradient descent for those methods. Again, it's the same algorithm that we saw before we are going to com be computing gradients on, uh, on L and we are going to be going downhill. That's the same, the same idea, only I have some new notation here, okay? So this is the gradient on my objective function uh, at the point theta and we have a name for it. It's this V of theta is my gradient at theta. V of theta, it comes up again and again and again. So V of theta is the, the gradient vector field as we say. A gradient vector field is all of these little arrows here. If I evaluate the gradient here, I get this little arrow. If I evaluate the gradient here, I get this other little arrow. And uh, a nice fact about optimization 
is that this gradient vector field is conservative, as we say. We don't need to get into the technical details. Uh, one, one way to describe it is if I take the line integral on a closed path, I get a zero. Okay, that's not very uh, important to fully understand right now. What's important is the implication that the arrows point towards the fixed point, which is, um, in this case, we're looking at the minimum we care about, okay? So the arrows point towards the minimum, and that's great. We follow the arrows, we get to the minimum. Uh, and this is, again, gradient descent with my new notation, okay? The thetas are the previous Ws, and this eta is the step size. It's the previous alpha. Sorry about that. Okay? All right, so this is great. And um, all right, so to do gradient descent, I've only changed this panel. Uh, one way to, to study this is we do what's called fixed point analysis, and we can express gradient descent as an operator. Now, this F is an operator that takes a theta, and it gives me a new theta. It takes my model parameters, and it gives me a new set of model parameters, okay? It's just a different notation for the same thing, gradient descent, we've been looking at. Okay, and then we can look at the Jacobian of the operator. What is the Jacobian of the operator? We take the operator and we take its gradient with respect to theta. And so this is the Jacobian of the operator. Gradient of theta with respect to theta is identity. Gradient of V of theta, uh, we can denote it like that. But remember that V of theta is already the gradient. V of theta is already defined as the gradient, so this is a second derivative we're taking. So now this is a Hessian. In optimization, this is a Hessian. But in general, the terminology I will be using is that this is the Jacobian of the objective, because we're taking two derivatives of the objective. This is the Jacobian of the objective, and this is the Jacobian of the operator. Okay, so I'm going to be mentioning two Jacobians. The Jacobian of the objective, which in optimization is the Hessian. And I also have the Jacobian of the operator, okay? So just to introduce a notation and, and be stable for our next slides. All right, okay, so we have some results that tell us that um, when do I get convergence to that fixed point, at least locally, if I start in a small neighborhood? Uh, Bertzekas will tell us that uh, if I look at the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the operator, and they are all within the unit circle, and I will elaborate a little bit, then I get convergence to that fixed point. Okay, this is a classic result. So essentially, this is a matrix, okay? This is a matrix, and its eigenvalues tell us uh, how our dynamics look like, okay? And if all of those eigenvalues have magnitude less than one, we converge to the fixed point, which is what we want. In optimization, this fixed point is a minimum in the, in the limited setting that we're describing at least. Okay, any, any questions about that? All right, how do we get the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the operator? We start from the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the objective function, okay, which is the Hessian. We look at the eigenvalues of the Hessian, we multiply them by eta, uh, we take the, the minus sign and then we add identity. We add one. And this is how we go from the eigenvalues of the objective to the eigenvalues of, uh, sorry, the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the objective to the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the operator. And it's the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the operator that tell us when we get convergence to the fixed point. All right? So this is, sorry, I should have shown you this. This is how we go from the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the objective to the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of the operator, okay? All right, so this is the story uh, about gradient descent and what happens with momentum, okay? We care about momentum. Again, we're dealing with momentum. Polyax momentum in particular is the same thing we saw before. So this was gradient descent. We added the momentum term. It's just new notation. Okay, and now, uh, how do we, okay, so one important thing is, how do we write this as an operator? I skipped a step here and I apologize, but the intermediate step is how do I write this momentum term as a simple uh, operator with uh, like a simple step-by-step -step operator? The, the issue here is that I have to go back two steps. I have to, for 
theta of t plus one, I have to look at theta t and theta t minus one. But there is a, there is a simple way to write this as a, as a one step operator by stacking theta t plus one on top of theta t. So now we're augmenting the, the, the state space in some sense, and we just follow the evolution of these two stacked vectors, theta t plus one and theta t. Then I can uh, do a stepwise uh, system. I can write a stepwise system for those. And this is the Jacobian of that stepwise operator. I did not show you the intermediate step, but this is its Jacobian, essentially. Okay? And, um, Okay, so the first thing I want to, to mention here uh, is that this is the first time that we see a Jacobian that is not symmetric, and that's, we're getting somewhere. So, so far, I did not mention that, but uh, the Jacobian of our operators have been symmetric. Let me, actually, let me go back and, and argue that. So, if we're doing optimization, this is a Hessian, and uh, Hessians are symmetric. Okay, if I take a function, I take its derivative and I take its second derivative, uh, that Hessian I will get is always symmetric. And of course, identity is symmetric. So this Jacobian of my operator is symmetric, which means it always has real eigenvalues. And that relates to the, to the point I made earlier. Always has real eigenvalues. And that's very important for the SQL. Okay, I forgot to tell you that. So. When we study the dynamics of momentum, this is the first time that we see an operator uh, that has a non-symmetric Jacobian, and that has implications. Non-symmetric Jacobian means that its eigenvalue could be imaginary. They typically are, especially in the most interesting settings, its eigenvalues have an imaginary component, okay? And um, in some sense, in this augmented state space where I stacked theta t plus one on top of theta t, if we look at that, the evolution and the trajectory in that space, there is rotation. And the rotation there is understood in, in classic results to be linked to those complex eigenvalues. The fact that I have imaginary components in my eigenvalues give us rotations, okay, in the system. That's a classic result, okay? So what's happening with games? Now we're moving on to, to the more interesting stuff. Uh, we're going to follow a difficult, uh, different, sorry. Uh, we're going to follow the same path for games. We're going to define the operator and uh, we're going to do it for some simple games. This is where I motivate wh why we care about games. Okay, I will skip this slide. <laughs> okay? For in the interest of time. We, we, don't, we don't need to do this. How much time do we have? Oh, no. Okay. So, <laughs> games. Uh, we have two objective functions. Let's say we have a two-player game. This is not the most general game setting, but let's say we have a two-player game. Now, each player is an agent that has their own objective function. These are different objective functions. And uh, one player has control of the theta decision variables. The other player has control of the phi decision variables. And now they, but both objectives depend on both sets of variables. So th there could be competition here. It could be adversarial or it could be less adversarial. There's all sorts of situations that can happen here, okay? But the main uh, commonality with before is that when those objective functions are smooth and differentiable, uh, and essentially the, the, the goal is that we're looking for local, local Nash equilibria, okay? Um, sorry about that. Forgot to define the Nash equilibrium. Let me take a step back. I'm sorry. Okay. What is the Nash equilibrium? It's the solution to a game. Okay. For people who are not aware of the Nash equilibrium, it's a set of, of theta values and phi values. It's theta star and phi star, starting from which no player can unilaterally improve their position. Okay, so if I start from theta star comma phi star, and I'm only changing theta star, I'm only changing theta, I cannot improve the situation for this player. Or if I'm only changing phi, I cannot improve the situation for this player. Okay, that is the Nash equilibrium. So now, for smooth and differential games, we often talk about local Nash equilibrium, equilibria, and they have to do with um, those fixed points that we've been discussing, okay? 
But the idea is that for this, this kind of game, people already use, and it's a good method to use, uh, gradient descent either with simultaneous updates, like the two players compute their gradients and apply them at the same time, or with alternating updates. Player one updates, player two updates, player one updates, player two updates. We have these two options, okay? But now the dynamics are completely different. That's the, that's the, the first part of the story, the motivation for what we're doing. And again, we have a gradient vector field that we name V, okay? And it's uh, the, the stacked two gradients of the two objectives, and it's non-conservative. What does that mean? The arrows do not point to the fixed point anymore. We can, we can follow the arrow and go round and round, or, in an, or maybe in a slow inward spiral, and uh, in some cases, uh, convergence is impossible. In some extreme cases, convergence is impossible just by gradient descent. I'll show you that. Um, but uh, more importantly, convergence can be very, very slow in, in cases where we can follow the arrows to get to the fixed point eventually. Convergence can be very, very, very slow. And um, again, this is a gradient descent operator, right? We have an extra decision variable, phi, that we did not have before. Um, and, and that, is, that is the problem. That is the problem with some of the games, these rotational dynamics, okay? And uh, it's, it's what I told you earlier. The Jacobian of the operator for gradient descent on games is generally non-symmetric, and it very frequently has complex eigenvalues which imply these rotations. It's the, the, the presence of the imaginary component in the eigenvalues that tell us we have these rotations and we do not like these rotations is the, is the, is the story. Okay, so we've been uh, seeing rotations in momentum. We've been seeing rotations in games. So the community, the machine learning community, you know, uh, GANs came out in the, in the first papers introducing it. People have been using what we know for optimization. We're going to use uh, a momentum method or ADAM and both of them have a momentum term of uh, 0 0.9 is the default. We're going to use a momentum value of 0 0.9. Is that a good thing? The answer is no, that's not a good thing. That's detrimental to the dynamics and to, for the convergence of these games to the fixed point, which is the Nash equilibrium we care about, okay? And that is the, yes, that is the spoiler. Positive momentum can be bad for certain games, okay? Not all games, I will try to qualify this statement in a bit, okay? And uh, I gave you the rest of the, of the story. So this is work that we did at, at Mila with uh, one of my students, Ray Hane, and uh, some of Simon's students. Uh, and we, we, recently, we recently submitted to AI stats. Yes. So this is a summary of our results. And because we're running out of time, I will do a targeted uh, attack on one of them. Okay, we have five minutes. The summary of our results is the following. If we focus on a very simple class of games called bilinear games, I will define that, then a negative momentum is optimal and it's actually necessary to get convergence if we're just focusing on gradient-based ba methods, okay? Uh, if we're focusing on specifically momentum uh, methods, I will, I will, I will describe the box in which we're making this statement in the next, in the next slide. In a, in a more general class of games, okay, um, negative momentum values are actually locally preferable near zero. What does this say? If, if you're seeing how well you're doing when your momentum value is zero, and then you're trying to decide, should I increase the momentum value or to positive values or decrease it to negative values? Locally, we're, we're going to tell you that you should be going negative. Okay, it doesn't say that the optimal value is negative. It says that this local decision, I'm at zero. Should I go lower or higher? You should go lower. That's the, the, what the second result is saying. And the third result is we have some empirical results on what's called the saturating GAN. Okay, all right. So very quickly, yes, here we're following the same state augmentation to define an operator for momentum on games. Uh, nothing is new here now. We have both a game and the momentum dynamics. We have everything together. And this is a bilinear game, okay? We have the two decision variables, theta and phi, and we have some matrix A in between. And um, 
the, the Nash equilibrium, that is the fixed point that we're looking for here, is 0,0. zero. zero theta equals 0 and phi equals 0 is the Nash equilibrium and fixed point that we are studying here. That's it, right? So it's easy, we understand it, we know, and we, we, it's very simple, so we can study its dynamics very easily. That's why we chose this, okay? It's the equivalent of studying a quadratic problem in optimization. Okay, so basically what uh, I'm going to tell you here is that the only, the only thing that gets you to the fixed point, if, if my, my box is, am I using simultaneous or alternating updates, is the first question. And the second question is, am I using positive, zero, or negative values for my momentum? In this specific uh, s setting, the only solution that gives us convergence is an alternating uh, gradient descent uh, approach with a negative momentum value, okay? Everything else does not converge. In the best case, uh, we, we get boundedness, something that does not diverge. But if you use simultaneous, it will diverge. If you use alternating with positive momentum, it will diverge, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's, that's the first result, and this is the proof by picture. It's not a proof, but it's more of a demonstration, okay? So just to give you a very rough idea, uh, before we wrap this up, because we're out of time. Um, so we're doing gradient descent, and our first option is simultaneous or alternating. So in this, this beige color, okay, uh, what happens, it shows you what happens when we do simultaneous updates with a zero momentum value, okay? We get here, we start here for this bilinear game I showed you, and we end up here. Now what happens when I, on top of that, I also use a mom positive momentum value? It's even worse, I go further out. What's my target? It's to be here. This is the, this is the Nash equilibrium we're targeting. We want to converge inwards towards the center but we go out here. When I use a negative momentum value on top of simultaneous updates, it gets a bit better, but it's still not sufficient to take us to the fixed point. Now, this olive, whatever I think they call it, color, um, shows alternating updates, right? So it tells me if I do not use a momentum parameter, zero, I will end up here, which is slightly worse than the distance with which I started. So we don't, we don't like that. If I use a positive momentum value, it makes things worse. If I use a negative momentum value, it actually brings me inside the circle. It has the same radi radius as the distance that I started with, which means I'm getting closer. And uh, that's kind of the intuition. Momentum, mom negative momentum will kind of cancel these natural rotations that we see here and help you uh, actually converge in, in some cases, okay? That's the, 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 main, the main idea. Um, I will, uh, oh man, this is super interesting, but I have to skip it, I think, because we're, we're out of time. I'm sorry, but <laughs> this, is, uh, thi this, this is a kind of a complex illustration on how the eigenvalues change when you, we use a negative momentum value. And essentially what I would be describing here is how these original eigenvalues of gradient descent move towards the inside when I use a negative momentum value, which means I get, you know, I get convergence or I get faster convergence. That's, that's the idea. And ah, no way. Empirical results, we have results on the saturating gun. And here's, here's where I get to, to tell you, uh, you know, when you should be expecting that this is a good idea, okay? So the, the first prescription is, you should always be tuning your momentum parameters, especially when you're messing with things that are not optimization. Games are not optimization, they have a different. Uh, so you will see, for example, historically, in the publications for around GANs, you will see momentum values that started from 0 0.9, 0 0.9, then you see, oh, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. There's a, there's a, there's a historic, monotonicity in the published results, and that's not an accident. Okay, the other, so you should always be tuning. The other question is, is negative always optimal? No. So what I showed you in the bilinear game is an extreme case. This bilinear game is extremely adversarial, as adversarial as they get. That's why you need negative momentum to control those extreme rotations. In modern GANs, the, the formulation is not always that adversarial. So the, the, the summary is you should be 
tuning your momentum value, sometimes you will get a negative being optimal, sometimes it will be close to zero, but uh, something like the default 0 0.9 is a very bad idea, okay? And the, the, the experiment here says that on the very first GAN that was introduced in the very first paper, that was a zero sum formulation, as we say, that was extremely adversarial. The authors uh, decided that they cannot train it. They called it saturating, that it's saturated, that's we, why we cannot train it. And they, they, they came up, right, they came up with another formulation that was less adversarial, and they used that, the non-saturating GAN. What our results, our experimental results show is that the reason that that original GAN did not work was that people were not tuning it right. You need a negative momentum value for that original GAN and not 0 0.9 that they were using. And that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>